We first had banging on our door, and we heard one gunshot, and then right after we heard another, and we heard multiple kids screaming and that people arguing. We were hiding in the corner of our classroom with the lights off and the doors locked, and right after that, we heard one more gunshot and someone got Someone started screaming like past our hallway. A sixth grader forced to talk about trauma no child should have to go through. Yet another school shooting in America, this time at a middle school in Idaho. Two children were injured. Thankfully, tonight it appears those injuries are not serious. This comes as lawmakers in Washington fail to take significant steps to curb gun violence in America. And it comes as one party tonight is mired in bitter infighting over its future. That battle shaped by President Trump's false claim of massive fraud in the 2020 election. Tonight, Republicans across the country are moving to enact bills based on that lie that would make it more difficult for people to vote. A school bus full of children hijacked by a suspect armed with a rifle. The children are safe. What we're learning tonight about that suspect. While case numbers are trending in the right direction here, the situation in India is dire. But a doctor on the ground is still finding cause for optimism. A little balanced message telling people to calm down and ensuring that this is and can be controlled is what I think is, is needed right now. His message tonight to the world, this will pass and India will prevail. And a stark reminder of the trauma that schoolgirls from Nigeria are still going through seven years after those kidnappings that made international headlines. How difficult was the transition to coming to America? I still have like nightmares. Seven years later, you still have nightmares. Yes, I do. But while much of the world has turned a blind eye, tonight schoolgirls are still in captivity. Our look at policing in America. Tonight, a focus on traffic stops. And what would happen if you remove police from that equation entirely? And your ticket out of this world, but it won't be cheap. A report on the future of space tourism, when it will begin, and who bought that first ticket? Who's ready to take a ride out of this world? Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. It was Thomas Jefferson who once said, we do not have government by the majority. We have government by the majority who participate. And tonight, Republicans at the helm of two of the country's most populous states are moving to pass bills to make it more difficult to vote. At the same time, the third most powerful Republican in the House is on the brink of losing her leadership post. In a tweet earlier this week, Liz Cheney said the 2020 presidential election was not stolen. Anyone who claims it was is spreading the big lie. Since then, her colleagues have lined up against her, and Republicans in state houses across the country are pushing laws based on false claims of fraud. In Texas today, lawmakers debated a new bill that, among a slew of other restrictions, would make it a felony for election officials to send out mail ballot applications without voters asking for them. And in Florida today, Governor Ron DeSantis signed a bill that imposes strict limits on mail-in voting and restricts ballot drop boxes. Our Jonathan Carl leads us off tonight on the state of the Republican Party and what comes next. It's Donald Trump's party. Just witness Florida's Republican Governor Ron DeSantis today signing into law new voting restrictions inspired by Trump's lies about the election. He did it before a Trump fan club called Club 45, live on Trump's favorite television show, Fox and Friends, all other so news organizations banned. Country. I'm actually going to sign it right here. It's going to take effect. <laughs> so, there you go. Bill is signed. After signing the bill, DeSantis signed Trump hats and a Trump flag. The Republicans in Congress are moving to oust Trump critic Liz Cheney as the number three Republican in House leadership. Her Trump-endorsed replacement, Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, has promoted lies about the election. I'm proud to stand up for President Trump. The day she appeared on a podcast hosted by Steve Bannon, the Trump loyalist who was pardoned by Trump after being indicted for allegedly defrauding Trump supporters. My vision is to run with support uh, from the president and his coalition of voters, which was the highest number of votes ever won by a Republican nominee in 2020. Sources close to Cheney say she knows she's likely to lose her leadership post, but she sees the stakes as much higher than that. She wrote in the Washington Post, quote, Republicans must decide whether we are going to choose truth and fidelity to the Constitution, adding there is good reason to believe Trump's language can provoke violence again. 
bit of an ominous threat and, or warning there. Jonathan Carl joins us now. John, Liz Cheney has, has really been one of the most conservative members of the House, but that doesn't seem to matter much right now. Uh, no, I mean, she was somebody who voted consistently with the Trump agenda. In fact, 93% of the time, according to an analysis by 538, far more so than Elise Stefanik. Uh, but that's apparently not the issue right now. Stefanik didn't even vote for the Trump tax cut, which was really the signature legislative achievement of the Trump presidency. But she did support the effort to challenge the election results here on January 6th. And even today, uh, she was talking about the need to fix a election security issues. Those were his, her words. And after the former president's second impeachment following the Capitol insurrection, we heard Senator Mitch McConnell harshly criticize Trump's election lies. Has that criticism faded away at this point? Uh, it sure seems so. If you go back to that speech that McConnell gave after the impeachment trial, uh, he was saying back then that Donald Trump hadn't gotten away with anything yet, uh, suggesting there would still be consequences for what happened on January 6th. But when asked about Liz Cheney today, he said that he is focused strictly on the future, on dealing with the Biden agenda, fighting the Biden agenda, not looking at the past. And meanwhile, states are, are taking action built on the former president's false claims about election fraud. Yeah, you saw it in Georgia, you saw it today in Florida. According to the Brennan Center, there are now nine states that have passed laws led by Republicans, Republican efforts uh, to, uh, to put some form of restrictions on, on the way the elections are, are uh, conducted. Whatever you think of the merits of any of those laws, uh, Lindsay, what is clear is that the reason why they are being proposed now by Republicans around the country is because of what uh, Donald Trump has said about election fraud. These are efforts to fix a problem that really didn't exist in the last election except in the allegations made uh, by Donald Trump. Jonathan Carl reporting in from the nation's capital. Thanks so much, John. Thank you, Lindsay. And now to another school shooting, this one at a middle school in Idaho. That's right, these were middle schoolers. Two students and a custodian were injured. And tonight, the alleged shooter, a sixth grade female student, is in custody. ABC's Kena Whitworth has the latest. Tonight, authorities say a sixth grade female student is in custody after opening fire in this Idaho middle school. Today we had the worst nightmare a, a school district could, um, could encounter. Just after 9 a.m. this morning, multiple agencies rushing to the scene. A sixth grade female student retrieved a handgun from her backpack. She filed, fired multiple rounds inside of the school and out. According to authorities, the suspect shooting three people inside Rigby Middle School, located less than 100 miles southwest of the famous Yellowstone National Park. Two students and a custodian sustaining non-life-threatening injuries. Lucy, a sixth grader, describing the terror. We heard one gunshot, and then right after we heard another, and all my friends and I were freaking out, and we were hiding in the corner of our classroom with the lights off and the doors locked. The school's 1,500 students going under lockdown. Lucy saying that after about an hour, they were evacuated from their classroom in a single file line. There was caution tape blocking the hallways and there were policemen blocking the hallways too. And when one of the guys moved, I think I saw a little bit of blood on the ground and I was helping my friends. We were all crying and we were so scared. The students then moved to a nearby high school, reuniting with their parents. The fear and relief etched on their faces as they embraced. No one is in danger at this time. And we're joined now by Kena Whitworth. Kena, what other details do we know this time? Well, Lindsay, we're hearing from authorities that it was a hero teacher that put, really put a stop to this. This teacher was able to disarm the student in a hallway and hold her until help arrived. We've also learned that all three gunshot victims were rushed to the hospital. The adult male was treated and released, and the two juveniles remain there in fair condition. What we don't know yet, Lindsay, is a motive here. Authorities are saying this investigation has just begun. You can imagine. It's just stunning, really, that this happened. Yeah. at a middle school. What's the reaction been like in the community? Well, I'll certainly tell you that it's one of shock. This is a small town. Uh, there is an outpouring of support now, and the superintendent 
said something really profound. He said, you know, you can prepare for something like this, but you are never ready. So they have canceled school district wide for tomorrow and they will have counselors on hand for everyone that needs it. And we can imagine some people in that community certainly will. Kena Whitworth, our thanks to you. Now to the pandemic after weeks of high cases and deaths as we've been reporting this week we're starting to see the turnaround that so many of us have been hoping for cases and deaths now at their lowest levels in seven months but there's still cause to be vigilant the CDC with a sobering projection that COVID death toll could reach 600,000 by Memorial Day health officials say that the key is to turning things around vaccinations are with Johnson reports. Tonight, a new army of foot soldiers in the war on COVID. This is a campaign. This is a campaign and we have two candidates. Our candidate is the vaccine for life and COVID for death. Across the country, workers going door to door, encouraging Americans to get the shot. We are just getting the information out about the vaccine. A new poll shows just 9% of unvaccinated Americans say they intend to get the shot as soon as possible. And with the next chapter almost here, vaccinating children. Moderna today reporting its vaccine is 96% effective in 12 to 17 year olds. The goal would be to make sure that the vaccine is available for vaccinating uh, adolescents over the course of the summer and at least before the coming school year. And any day, the FDA is expected to greenlight the Pfizer vaccine for adolescents after the company reported it was 100% effective in kids 12 to 15 with no serious side effects. All four kids in the Dropic family volunteered for the Pfizer trials through Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Don't be worried. Don't be scared. Um, the people here know what they're doing. Tonight, COVID cases hitting their lowest levels in seven months. Experts at UCSF projecting that California is on track to reach herd immunity by June 15th. We never wanted to get to herd immunity with a combination of natural infection and, and vaccination, but that's what um, California went through. New York City now planning to roll out mobile vaccination sites, offering the Johnson & Johnson vaccine for visiting tourists in places like Times Square and Central Park. Come here, it's safe, it's a great place to be and we're going to take care of you tonight with easing restrictions and Broadway tickets going on sale for fall shows the city increasingly poised for a comeback is there this feeling though that New York is coming back yes yes it's going to be a terrific summer it's going to be a good summer yeah Love that optimism. And Whit Johnson joins us now from what looks like a very vibrant Times Square behind you. And Whit, we're also learning more about the effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine against some concerning variants. Lindsay, these are two new real world studies and they show that the Pfizer vaccine is highly effective against those concerning variants from South Africa and the UK, especially when it comes to preventing severe outcomes like pneumonia and even death. Lindsay. Whit Johnson, our thanks to you. COVID cases and hospitalizations have been on the rise in India, home to about 1.4 billion people. India currently has nearly three and a half million active cases. Containing the surge has certainly been a challenge. Today, the health ministry data shows a record 412,262 new COVID-19 cases just in the past 24 hours and a record astonishing 3,980 deaths in that same time period. For more on this, I'm joined now by Dr. Ram in Chennai, infectious disease specialist at Apollo Hospital in India there. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, doctor. Uh, as a critical care specialist in India, working with the sickest of patients, what are you seeing right now in your hospital? We are seeing an increasing number of cases. The case load has been steadily rising over the last few weeks. It started initially in Mumbai and then Delhi, and now we are seeing the cases rising up in Chennai also. And it, there is a lot of panic here in the country. People are anxious, they are worried, and they're all rushing to hospitals, even though a lot of them are stable. They are thronging to hospitals to get admitted because they are scared. Uh, why do you think that you're seeing your peak now? Because many countries, America included, really started to see things bad last summer and last spring. But it seems like there was kind of a delay there in India. India has always been lagging a few months behind Europe and the U.S. Uh, the first wave when it happened in the U.S. in last February, March, April, 
In India, we saw the peak climbing up much later, starting in June or July and going up till September, October. So we were expecting there could be a second wave, which is again a little delay. And probably the relaxation of the government rules, the pandemic fatigue setting in, and maybe the new variants coming in have all added to this and resulting in this new uh, second wave here. And today, the health ministry data reported that COVID-19 infections have now surged beyond 21 million in India, and it's likely far worse with new and death cases going underreported. Medical experts say that India's actual figures could be five to ten times the official tallies that we're seeing. How concerned are you that India is potentially losing the fight to COVID? Actually, during the first wave, India did far better than most of the countries because we were in significant lockdown. And the number of people who tested at that time were, I feel, much lower than this time. People were a little scared, worried. So the testing probably was not as robust as it is now. Now it is predominantly hitting people who are more educated, people who are a little more affluent. So the minute somebody has a sore throat or a cough, they immediately go in for a test. Tests are also more accessible, cheaper. So a far more number of tests are being done this time rather than it was done last time. So the actual number of cases this time, I feel the pickup is much, much more. And that is the reason why we are seeing such a significant increase. In hospitals, they're certainly struggling desperately to have enough beds. Communities are pleading for oxygen, and there's a shortage of supplies. Uh, we've even seen medical centers turn the sick away, or in some cases have two different people who are sick in the same bed. What do you believe needs to happen to get this situation under control? I think the main reason this is happening is the panic and anxiety among people, as I mentioned earlier. There are a lot of people who are rushing to hospitals, people who can be managed at home, people who want to get admitted because they are worried that they would suddenly deteriorate and die. So they are clamoring for beds, they are all clamoring for oxygen. All this is adding to the shortage of oxygen and to the beds. So I think what we need now is a little more balanced communication. And lastly, just to kind of play off of that, Dr. Ram, the upsurge in misinformation, really, I, I think kind of is, is what you're talking about in part. Uh, and, and in some cases also because of the response of the federal government refusing to impose a national lockdown, that's created distrust among some people. Uh, what are the, the growing concerns that you may be having beyond the fact that people People are, you know, have a little bit of a tickle in their throat and they go to the hospital. The, the free press has led to a phenomenal infodemic where people are bombarded with information and people tend to learn to interpret it themselves and probably wrongly too. So we need a little more balanced reporting to the press. So I think we are learning it a little late. And a country which is as large as India with 1.4 billion population, it is not an easy job to ensure that things are equitably distributed. So all that is being you know, done now. Lastly, what we learned in the first time, balancing between lives and livelihood. The lockdown created a lot of problems with people's livelihoods. So the lessons learned are now people are a little bit, they've burned their fingers. The government is also a little cautious in how it is approaching. But I think we need people to be a little more balanced, understand that this too shall pass. We shall prevail, definitely. Okay, some optimism there. Dr. Ram, we thank you so much reporting in from Chennai, India, and your country certainly remains in our thoughts. Please stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. It is one of the most dreadful scenarios that a parent of school-aged children can imagine. A bus carrying almost two dozen students hijacked by a man armed with a rifle. ABC's Steve Osinsami brings us the very latest. Authorities in South Carolina tonight are sharing this security video from the bus full of kids that was on its way this morning to an elementary school in Columbia. As the students were getting in, a trainee from the nearby Army base shoved his way on with an Army-issued rifle. Police are identifying him as 23-year-old Jovan Calazzo and say he was trying to leave the military and wanted the bus driver to get him to the next town so he could get home to New Jersey. These kids and the bus driver uh, were very traumatized and, and, and feared their life. There were 18 kids on the bus, and police are praising the driver who kept his cool. The sheriff says that after several minutes, the 23-year-old stopped the bus and let the driver and kids get off. And then he continued to drive the bus for a short distance where he abandoned the bus and took off on foot. He was arrested and is charged tonight with 19 counts of kidnapping, armed robbery, carjacking, and more. 
At the Post, his commander is apologizing tonight to the school's families, explaining that Colazzo was just three weeks into his training. Uh, understanding that three weeks in, uh, we do experience several uh, soldiers that over the course of their initial stages just have that desire, that anxiety, and due to separation uh, from their, their families to get home. And we think that was truly uh, his intent and, and nothing beyond that. And Steve Osinsami joins us now. Steve, the bus driver is being praised for his calm and safe handling of this terrifying situation. The driver didn't know it at the time, but the suspect's weapon had no ammunition. That's right. That's coming from the post commander who says that the gun had no ammunition because they don't give bullets to trainees who are three weeks in. But the same commander acknowledges that no one on the bus, not the bus driver nor the kids, knew that. Lindsay. Steve Osinsami, our thanks to you. While the Biden administration says that they're trying to right the wrongs of their predecessor when it comes to family reunification, the reality is the ongoing humanitarian crisis at the border is still something that they are grappling with as more than 20,000 minors remain in custody. ABC's Matt Gutman joins us now from outside of the facility in Donna, Texas. And Matt, you just wrapped up a tour inside the Donna facility. Walk us through what you saw there. Lindsay, just, I guess, six weeks ago or even less, this facility had hideous overcrowding. There were so many children, unaccompanied minors, packed into uh, specific pods. Those are rooms that they had to take turns sleeping on the floor. That's how bad it was. Now, there are about 10 times fewer unaccompanied children there now than there were six weeks ago, but it still looked like it was very busy, right? Um, that's what was so surprising. Uh, still a lot of kids going through as soon as you walk in the door, you see uh, that people are checked for lice, not checked for COVID because that would take too much time, but they are checked for lice, which is was surprising to us. Um, there are about 330 unaccompanied migrant children there right now. But when you walk in, you see that there's still mud from the Rio Grande River stuck on their pants. Um, they're waiting for food. They're in line to be processed. There are mothers there still breastfeeding their kids. Uh, some of the ages of the children that we saw, Lindsay, shocking. Uh, I, I just briefly was able to speak with a four-year-old before I was hustled along, but he said he was four, his other brother was six. Um, so lots of ch tender age children there still, lots of teenage kids as well. What is clear is that they are able to process children out of these facilities, which are really only meant to house children for a short period of time and into those long-term shelters much, much more quickly now. It used to take on average about five, six days. They've now got it down to 24 hours hours, uh, which the officials at this facility uh, said they're actually very proud of. Lindsay. And Matt, during a conference call today with the Biden administration, one official said that what we're seeing now is, quote, the beginning of what it looks like to have a well-managed border. Based on what you saw today, does it look to you like it slowly but surely things are getting under control? I think that they're managing part of the process here, but the officials here conceded that their intelligence is saying that there are more people ready to come across the border. Uh, the number of unaccompanied migrant children crossing is about half what it was at its peak. That has made the system more manageable here. But when those numbers pick up again, and we're told that they are likely going to do just that, it could become unmanageable again. So I think it's too early to say that this is the sign of a well-managed border regime. I don't think we're quite there yet, Lindsay. Appreciate your following up on this. Matt Gutman, thanks so much. And when we come back, the charges now filed against a man accused of stabbing two Asian women at a bus stop. And remember that hashtag, bring back our girls, the Nigerian schoolgirls kidnapped by terrorists. Tonight, we have the remarkable story of what happened in the years after it faded from the headlines. But up next, missing plates or expired tags. Those are some of the reasons that led to tragic police stops. In tonight's Policing in America, we explore if there's a better way to keep our roads safe. Three-year-old vanishes in the middle of the night. In an instant, my life was forever changed. There was this police interrogation, and then the young father confesses. But and his family knew that he was not the killer. It was just unthinkable. Most of us say, I would never confess to something I didn't do. People would be surprised. Now, a mother's powerful interview and... For the first time ever, we're actually hearing from the man who really did this. David Muir reporting. The new 2020 Friday night on ABC. Somewhere out in the country, there's a man. I'm Bobby. Doing good things for good people. He'll walk a mile in their shoes. <laughs> 
Then get him a brand spanking new pair when he's done. Just wanted you to have this. Thank you. You name it, whoa, whoa, whoa. he'll try. <laughs> Even if it breaks him. Bobby Bones, they're trying to break you. Oh, great. Breaking Bobby Bones. New series Monday, May 31st at 10 on National Geographic. Mike Tyson was called the baddest man on the planet because he was the baddest man on the planet. There were three black men who ruled the world. Michael Jordan, Michael Jackson, Mike Tyson. The only question was, which Mike do you want to be? <laughs> Mike Tyson in the ring, he was unbeatable. But outside the ring, the climb, the crash, the comeback. If you could talk to 20-year-old Mike, what would you say to him? It's going to hurt. The Knockout premieres Tuesday night, May 25th on ABC. Authorities tonight in San Francisco have charged a man with attempted murder and two counts of inflicting injury after he allegedly stabbed two Asian women in San Francisco. Both were attacked at a bus stop and are being treated for their injuries. Authorities are still debating whether or not to call it a hate crime. This week, we've been taking a closer look at policing in America, and tonight we're zeroing in on traffic stops. Millions of them occur every year in the U.S. Police officers pull over drivers for speeding, running red lights, expired or missing tags. Most of them are considered non-events, but as we've seen lately, they can sometimes turn deadly in a flash. For people of color especially, they can be heart-pounding encounters. But what if police were removed from traffic enforcement altogether? Some parts of the country are giving that a look. Here's ABC's Devin Dwyer. The traffic stops that turn into tragedy often begin with a minor infraction or none at all. A broken tail light, dangling air freshener, simply looking like a criminal suspect. Last month, it was an alleged expired tag that led police to stop 20-year-old Dante Wright. I lost my son. He's never coming back. I can't accept that. Wright's death by police bullets in Minnesota has prompted fresh soul-searching over why traffic stops in America too often end violently for people of color. When a black person is stopped for a traffic violation, it should not end up in a death sentence. An ABC News analysis of millions of traffic stops in a dozen U.S. cities last year found black drivers are more likely to be stopped and more likely to be searched than white drivers. On the side of the road, things can quickly go south. We got pulled over for a busted tail light in the back. Philando Castile's girlfriend was filming in 2016 after he was fatally shot as he tried to provide ID to an officer. He was never a bad man. He never did anything to hurt anyone. Late last year, Army 2nd Lieutenant Caron Nazario was stopped over a missing license plate on his new SUV, even though a temporary tag was in the back window. An officer pepper sprayed Nazario as his hands were out the window. Whoa, hold on. What's going on? Hold on. For years, civil rights groups have complained that traffic stops have been covered for racial profiling and criminal fishing expeditions. And now some say traffic enforcement should be removed from police responsibilities altogether. Even the best police training is not going to get us to the deep structural reforms that we need uh, to stop these incidents from happening. Criminologist and law professor Jordan Blair Woods is urging cities and states to stop cops from stopping drivers, proposing the creation of unarmed civilian traffic monitors who could issue tickets for violations but would not run background checks or detain, search, or arrest drivers. So rather than police, let's say, stopping you for a taillight violation or an equipment violation or a stop sign violation, you would have um, these civil employees or these traffic monitors who are essentially conducting the same tasks. Um, but the difference is that the traffic stop would stop and end at that traffic violation. Nearly 19 million drivers were stopped by police in 2018. Woods says if most or all of those encounters were eliminated, unnecessary confrontations could be avoided. They just illegally entered my car, and I'm being forcefully removed. Take a look at me. I'm being I'm specimen right here, buddy. In 2019, Virginia State Troopers pulled over Derek Thompson for an expired inspection decal. The stop captured on Thompson's cell phone camera quickly got physical. The officer was later fired. We don't necessarily do training on de-escalation on a regular basis. Everybody gets it to a small extent, but probably not nearly enough 
considering how important it is in terms of how do you really do your job. Even officers who have years of training who are involved in the training are involved in uh, these types of uh, killings of unarmed black men. The idea of removing police from the traffic enforcement business is getting a serious look in a handful of U.S. cities and states. In March, Virginia imposed new limits on when cops can pull drivers over. A loud exhaust pipe or the smell of marijuana no longer count as a primary reason to initiate a stop. Berkeley, California, last summer became the first city in the nation to ban police officers from making traffic stops, transferring that duty to unarmed traffic agents. I think the goal... Having difficulty there with the rest of Devin's piece. Still ahead here on Prime, police are trying to figure out what happened after this photo when a two-year-old was kidnapped from church. The major American city offering up vaccines to tourists. And with more cities and states opening up, we take a look at the restaurant industry and their hopes for a strong rebound by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. The CDC joins all of us on this National Nurses Appreciation Day to thank them for all they have have done during this pandemic. Mike Tyson was called the baddest man on the planet because he was the baddest man on the planet. There were three black men who ruled the world. Michael Jordan, Michael Jackson, Mike Tyson. The only question was, which Mike do you want to be? <laughs> Mike Tyson in the ring, he was unbeatable. But outside the ring, the climb, the crash, the comeback. If you could talk to 20-year-old Mike, what would you say to him? It's going to hurt. The Knockout premieres Tuesday night, May 25th on ABC. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. A three-year-old vanishes. In an instant, my life was forever changed. And then the young father confesses. But and his family knew that he was not the killer. Now, for the first time ever, we're actually hearing from the man who really did this. 2020, Friday on ABC. Somewhere out in the country, there's a man. I'm Bobby. Walking a mile in people's boots and buying a new pair when he's done. Just wanted you to have this. Thank you. Breaking Bobby Bones, new series Monday, May 31st at 10 on National Geographic. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America. America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored, winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back, everyone, and now to the restaurant industry, which has gotten battered during the pandemic. But now COVID restrictions are lifting, and this week the federal government launched the Restaurant Revitalization Fund to help. We take a closer look by the numbers. Restaurant and food service sales dropped $280 billion below their expected levels between March of 2020 and April of 2021. And during that time, 110,000 restaurants across the country closed permanently or long-term, according to the National Restaurant Association. But 
now there's a new federal relief program, the $28.6 billion restaurant revitalization fund, which got more than 186,000 applications from restaurants in just the first two days, according to the White House. The fund will provide grants of up to $10 million to restaurants, bars, food trucks, caterers, bakeries, and other eateries impacted by COVID. This relief is separate from the payment protection program, which paid out $40 billion in its latest round of funding to accommodation and food service businesses. These businesses collectively received 17% of those PPP funds, making the industry as a whole the top beneficiary. President Biden touted the new relief, saying that the restaurants play a big role in our economic recovery and our sense of community. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. Nearly a year to the day after a Colorado husband made a tearful plea for his wife's return after she vanished, why prosecutors now believe he murdered her. And the remarkable story of what happened to two Nigerian girls abducted by terrorists during an incident that shocked the world. Plus, if you want to go to space, now you can. It'll cost you. Our look at the future of space tourism. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Big hug, Rich. We tell all our patients how much they are loved. We hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Across the country, workers going door to door, encouraging Americans to get the shot. We are just getting information out about the vaccine. Tonight, COVID cases hitting their lowest levels in seven months. Experts at UCSF projecting that California is on track to reach herd immunity by June 15th. We never wanted to get to herd immunity with a combination of natural infection and, and vaccination, but that's what um, California went through. A new poll shows just 9% of unvaccinated Americans say they intend to get the shot as soon as possible. Moderna today reporting its vaccine is 96% effective in 12 to 17 year olds. The FDA is expected to green light the Pfizer vaccine for adolescents after the company reported it was 100% effective in kids 12 to 15 with no serious side effects. 
We've had a child taken from Riverview Baptist Church Nursery. It's from a female driving a black older model van. Police say the woman in this photo is seen leading two-year-old Noah Trout out of a church nursery in Ripplemead, Virginia. Authorities have identified her as 45-year-old Nancy Fridley. We have been unable to determine a motive. They say the child was found safe the next day, about two hours away in eastern West Virginia. According to police, he was being held at the home of Nancy Fridley and her boyfriend, Bobby Taylor. Both are now facing felony abduction and drug charges. Police report that the child was unharmed, but say that all his hair was shaved off his head. A major turn in the case of Colorado mom, Suzanne Morphew, who went missing last Mother's Day. We believe that she's not alive. Her husband is in custody, charged with her murder. Nearly a year to the day after he made this tearful plea for his wife Suzanne's safe return. I will do whatever it takes to get you back. It's pretty unlucky. A judge today ordering him to be held without bail, but allowing him visits with his two daughters. It was May 10th, Mother's Day last year, when the 49-year-old mother of two went for a bike ride and never returned. The only signs of her, her bike and helmet and a personal item that police will not describe. We do have information that led us to this point today. Authorities interviewing more than 400 people. There's still a lot of questions of what happened to her, where is she, why? The Army announcing it plans to put a civilian in charge of the command that conducts criminal investigations. We will continue to hold the Army accountable in terms of making sure they have a first-rate criminal investigation uh, division. Those changes are in the wake of violent crimes at Fort Hood, Texas, including the death of specialist Vanessa Guillen. Vanessa Guillen did not die in vain. She will be forevermore associated with our commitment to take sexual harassment and sexual assault cases out of the chain of command. New York City's Mayor Bill de Blasio announced that New York will offer the Johnson & Johnson vaccine to any tourist as long as the state approves. This is going to start as soon as we get that approval. We're ready to go this weekend. We want to welcome more and more people into the vaccination effort. Mobile vaccination sites will be available in areas frequented by tourists. We want to go the extra mile and make it easy for tourists. If they're here, get vaccinated while you're here. This coming soon after the announcement that New York City's Broadway will reopen in September. This summer, you're going to see tourism come alive again in New York City. You're going to see a lot of jobs come back because of it. Welcome back, everybody. Bring back our girls. It was a hashtag and social media movement after young girls in northeastern Nigeria were abducted by terrorists from their boarding school in the middle of the night. It rocked the world back in 2014. And now, seven years later, we catch up with some of these young ladies who managed to escape. In the northeast region of Nigeria, flanked by the Mandara Mountains and the vast Sambisa Forest, is Borno State. Its slogan is Home of Peace, but for the past 12 years, it has been a far cry from any semblance of peace. Boko Haram, a jihadist terrorist organization with ties to ISIS, has made Borno its home. They've terrorized the region, launching coordinated military-style attacks, forcing children, most of them girls, to become human bombs. According to the UN, they've displaced more than two million Nigerians. Back in 2014, the insurgency gained worldwide attention after they abducted nearly 300 girls from a boarding school in Chibok, a southern district of Borno. The kidnapping sparked an international outcry, prompting the hashtag, bring back our girls. This unconscionable act was committed by a terrorist group determined to keep these girls from getting an education. On the eve of a final exam, in the middle of the night, as many of the girls slept, the terrorists invaded, kidnapping them. In Hausa, Boko Haram means Western education is forbidden. Denied an education, there were reports that many of the girls were being forced into marriages. Boko Haram releasing propaganda videos in an attempt to win over Nigerian hearts. 
In an act of defiance, students like Naomi Adamu managed to hide journals originally given to them for Quranic study, but ultimately used as a beacon of hope. The pages are lined with notes to their families, as well as firsthand accounts of their time at the camp. They said, who and how many of you will turn to Muslim? So many of us because of fear. Some of us stand up and went inside. So they said, the rest that remain, you want to die. Is that why you don't want to be Muslim? We are going to burn you. Life in Boko Haram captivity was a very bad one for me. We were treated like slaves. We even had to resort to using sand to clean up whenever we had our menstrual cycle. Naomi spent three long years in captivity before finally making her escape. To date, more than half of the kidnapped girls have been released. Joy Bashara and Lydia Pogu were classmates of Naomi and were 17 and 15, respectively, on the night of the attack. Both girls described praying before taking a leap of faith, jumping from the trucks used to transport the girls on the night they were kidnapped. So I had to pick if I wanted to die or go with these people, not knowing what they would be doing with me. So I chose to die. I chose to die so my parents could actually find my cops on the floor and to go with these people and not know where I'm going or they will never find me again. Just last week, they graduated from Southeastern University in Florida. How difficult was the transition to coming to America? I still have like nightmares. Seven years later, you still have nightmares. Yes, I do. It's difficult to let it go and actually forget or move on or heal when exactly the same thing that happened seven years ago is still going on today. People are still dying every day from on the roads attack from Boko Haram and everything. Seven years ago, nothing was stopped or it's less of a problem. So it is more difficult to just be like, oh, it's on the, all in the past. Let me focus on healing when it's actually still going on. The prospect of bringing about change is what's helped push Joy and Lydia forward. It told me I couldn't go back to school. I couldn't continue more education. That education is taboo. Well, it took me a while and I decided that if I actually wanted to become a doctor, I have to go to school for that to happen. And I came way too far to just give it up just because of a stupid voice in my head. And it's a super exciting that when I was walking on the stage, I was like, yep, nothing can stop me, no matter what. I am going to get this degree and I'm going to be who I want to be. Nobody can stop me. As Joy and Lydia said, Boko Haram is still a serious threat. Today, many of the girls fear retaliation against themselves as well as their families back in Nigeria. This past March, Pulitzer-nominated journalists Joe Parkinson and Drew Hinshaw released a book featuring Naomi, as well as several other girls who escaped from Boko Haram, called Bring Back Our Girls, the untold story of the global search for Nigeria's missing schoolgirls. One of the authors, Drew Hinshaw, joins us tonight. Thanks so much, Drew. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So you and Joe have been reporting on Boko Haram before Chibok was on anyone's radar. How were you able to gain so much access to these women? We spent years reporting on what it took to free them. And the more we dove into that question, we realized we couldn't really tell that story without talking to them about what it took to survive. And over a period of years, we met Naomi. She showed us the diary that she kept tied on her, under on her for three years. Um, we met her, her friends who in, in captivity, um, she staged hunger strikes with, and we slowly began to speak with them about um, not just what they'd been through, but how they resisted. And you've talked about how people learned of Boko Haram through the Chibok girls, their story serving as a window into a much more complicated issue. What has it been like watching this story really explode through social media? Yeah, they started out as, um, you know, what's called the identifiable victim effect. Boko Haram had kidnapped tens of thousands of, of uh, well, Boko Haram has kidnapped tens of thousands of children. But this particular group, you know, they were studying for their final exams. They were on the cusp of becoming adults in a part of the country where only 4% of women finish high school. 
And the details of that kidnapping were so heart-wrenching that I think it allowed people all over the world to connect to this war that had been um, waged for years and, and it was sort of unimaginable in its, in its brutality. Do you feel that, that social media really was the effective game changer in order to get this, this idea, the, the, the attention that it needed? Absolutely. For two weeks, almost nobody was looking for these young women except their parents. Their moms had walked a dirt road looking for them in the open countryside. And then this hashtag bubbled up on Twitter, and all of us, so many of us, clicked like or retweet, and suddenly, you know, seven foreign militaries, spies, glory hunters, bounty hunters, mercenaries poured into Nigeria looking for this one group of young women out of the many children that Boko Haram had kidnapped. And tell me about the situation now, because many people are thinking, oh, we got the girls back, everything's fine, but the threat continues. The, an economy of kidnapping children for ransom has developed in the north of Nigeria. And unfortunately, I think what Chibok showed is if you are willing to go into a school and, and take somebody's children and drive them into a forest, um, the state has no choice but to negotiate with you. And and to and to see you know what it can offer you to return these uh, these children. We've seen five kidnappings over the past few months in Nigeria of, of children. Drew Hinshaw, thank you so much for your time and your insight. Appreciate it. Thank you too. And switching gears now, who wants to go to space? Amazon founder Jeff Bezos announced that his space company will launch its rocket in July and they are auctioning off a seat. His company is not the only one now making space tourism a reality. Gio Benitez has more. And we have lift up. The beginning of space tourism is just months away. Blue Origin, created by Amazon founder Jeff Bezos, announcing it will launch its first crew into space on July 20th, with one seat going to the highest bidder. We're auctioning off the first seat to benefit our foundation, Club for the Future, so that future generations can do something extraordinary up there. We don't know who the other crew members will be, but that one civilian makes it the first time any private citizen launches into space from American soil. The flight will last just minutes, enough to get a view of Earth from almost no gravity. But these people are already getting that view of Earth. ABC News Live speaking with the NASA astronauts aboard the International Space Station right now. I know a lot of people have dreamed of going into space, and so there's all this talk about space tourism. What are your thoughts on that and how this could potentially be expanding? This will ho hopefully open the door for many more people, um, civilians um, per se, to be able to come up and experience what we get to experience um, quite a bit. So I think it's a great idea and looking forward to what the next decade holds for space tourism. And the business of space tourism may soon get crowded. SpaceX is launching a fully civilian crew into space to orbit the Earth in September. 38-year-old millionaire entrepreneur Jared Isaacman buying up all the seats on the flight. He's donated them to St. Jude Children's Hospital. The flight, dubbed Inspiration 4, will have no professional astronaut on board. Megan and Shane, we all watched you just sitting in that pilot and commander's seat. Does it concern you at all that no professional Professional astronaut like yourselves will be on Inspiration 4. Well, we've been through the SpaceX training flow, and we know that those professionals are going to do a great job training this crew, and they're going to put them through a training flow that's very similar to what we did. They won't obviously need to do the portion that allows them co to come to the International Space Station, but they're going to get all of the same training as far as monitoring um, the vehicle systems and as far as becoming familiar with their their spacesuits and the emergency equipment. So, you know, I don't know the Inspiration for crew, but I do know the SpaceX team, and I know that they're going to do a great job preparing this crew for what they're going to experience. Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic is hoping to launch tourist flights into zero gravity next year. And then there's Axiom Space, launching three civilians to the ISS in January with an astronaut. 71-year-old real estate investor and philanthropist Larry Connor will be on board. Somebody said to me, you'll be the second oldest person ever to go into outer space. And my response, which they already knew, well, I think age is overrated. 
Larry and the crew will be training for 15 weeks with Axiom Space, commanding the first flight, decorated former NASA astronaut Michael L.A. The cost per ticket, $55 million. Back in the 1920s and 30s, only very, very wealthy people could fly. Now people get on an airplane to go to a birthday party. That's going to happen in commercial human spaceflight. Mike Safardini ran NASA's space station program. Now he's Axiom CEO and says research is his North Star. There's pharmaceuticals made today on orbit that you probably don't realize. There's pharmaceuticals made on the ground based on testing that's done on orbit years ago that you, you don't realize. A mission Larry Connor can't wait to be a part of. What's your wife saying to you? She's seen me do a lot of really unusual things. So the look is usually like this. <laughs> and that's, here he goes again. And she's right, here we go again. And I gotta tell you, it is not cheap. A seat on Virgin Galactic costs about 250,000 bucks over on SpaceX and Axiom. You're looking at tens of millions per seat and the money raised from that Blue Origin auction will go to a foundation for students. Lindsay? Fascinating what the future holds there as far as space travel. Geo, our thanks to you. And you've heard the saying, there's an app for that. Now real estate is going virtual and you can sell your house right from your smartphone. It's a story that we first saw in USA Today. ABC's Rebecca Jarvis has more. When Brian Westerman decided to sell this Tennessee home in January, he didn't hire an agent, host an open house, or make any repairs. Instead, he uploaded a few pictures and some information to Open Door, an online real estate platform that flips homes and had an offer in less than 48 hours. And that first initial offer in that video walkthrough, they say, yeah, here's the price, here's what we think repairs are, here's kind of your net proceeds. It's a relatively new trend in real estate called iBuyers or instant buyers. Open Door bills itself as a way to skip the hard parts of selling your home for those sellers looking for a fast and streamlined process. It's those customers that are really looking for certainty and simplicity that want to avoid the hassle of prepping their homes, of dealing with showings of their homes, of going through the financing. Open Door has bought and sold over 90,000 homes since 2014 in 30 markets across the country. They charge a transaction fee that varies, but is currently around 5% of the sale price. We believe we can price these homes really competitively and make great offers to sellers. And we're willing to take that risk of what that resale is going to be. Other companies like Zillow and Redfin offer similar services. And while the pandemic may have helped spur on the practice of doing business virtually, experts say it may not be right for everyone. There is something to be said about working with a human who comes with a world of experience, who can hold your hand through the process. Open Door purchased Westerman's house for $335,000 after an inspection, then sold it last month for 348,000. We closed in two weeks and I walked to a title company, signed some paperwork and the money was in my account literally three weeks later. Quick and easy, our thanks to Rebecca for that. And before we go tonight, the image of the day. A lone raised hand from a demonstrator during a rally focusing on mothers who lost loved ones to police violence. They were demanding immediate action by President Biden and Congress to address policing in America. We are, of course, following the legislation moving through Congress closely. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of several things. The families now banding together to rebuild Asian-run businesses, so many of them battered by the pandemic and racism. And our sneak peek at this week's concert aimed at creating vaccine fairness. It's being billed as the concert to reunite the world. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news.
powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Do you believe the Reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. The battle for the soul of the Republican Party continues with GOP-led state houses continuing to pass voting restrictions based on the lie that the 2020 election was a fraud. Florida's governor signed a new bill only allowing Fox News at the signing. It limits drop boxes and mail-in balloting. Texas may soon do the same. This is the number three Republican member of the House is expected to lose her leadership job. The Biden administration is claiming progress in reducing the number of unaccompanied migrant children in border control facilities, but about 20,000 of them are living in other facilities run by a separate government agency. And the details continue to come in surrounding another school shooting, this time at an Idaho middle school. It all began this morning when a student opened fire, forcing the school to go into lockdown and children to huddle in the dark in their classrooms. Two students and a custodian were injured. A female teacher is being hailed as a hero for disarming the shooter until she was taken into custody. Now to the latest on the coronavirus pandemic. Hope is on the horizon with the CDC projecting a decline in new COVID-19 cases with more Americans getting vaccinated. Moderna's booster shot to help fight against the more contagious variants that are circulating show promise, according to the drug maker. Here's ABC's Rena Roy. After more than a year of pain and uncertainty, a glimmer of hope. The CDC now saying if the U.S. continues vaccinating, masking, and social distancing, we could see a sharp decline in COVID cases by July. That we have the path out of this and models, once projecting really grim news, now offer reasons to be quite hopeful for what the summer may bring. For now, the push continues to get more Americans vaccinated. The mayor of Lancaster, California, even offering scholars for teens who get their shot. For us, one is to get the young people vaccinated, to give them an incentive to doing it, but also to counteract the vaccine resistance. And if state officials sign off, New York City could start offering the Johnson & Johnson shot to tourists at popular sites. We want to go the extra mile, make it easy for tourists. Both Pfizer and Moderna hoping to get emergency use authorization to vaccinate younger Americans ages 15 and under, as they also work to protect against the growing threat of variants. Moderna saying its booster shots are working well in clinical trials. Not only can we boost people's immunity back up and keep it high during the pandemic, but also that we can specifically boost it up against some of the new variants of concern. Many cities and states plowing ahead with reopening plans. Minnesota expected to lift most COVID restrictions at the end of the month. But we've got a three-step plan that's going to come. The end the statewide COVID-19 restrictions by May 28th, and we'll drop the state uh, mask mandate by July 1st, or if we can hit 70% vaccinations.
Our thanks to Rena for that. It has almost been one year since a Colorado wife and mother disappeared on Mother's Day. In a new development, Suzanne Morphew's husband has been charged with murder, and today he appeared in court for the very first time. Our Stephanie Ramos reports. Nearly a year to the day after he made this tearful plea for his wife Suzanne's safe return. I will do whatever it takes to get you back. Honey, I love you. Authorities arresting Barry Morphew Wednesday, charging him with her murder. We believe that she's not alive. A judge today in Colorado ordering him to be held without bail, but allowing him visits with his two daughters. It was May 10th, Mother's Day last year, and Barry was reportedly away on business when the 49-year-old mother of two went for a bike ride and never returned. The majority of people thought that he did it from the beginning. The only signs of her, her bike and helmet and a personal item that police will not describe. We do have information that led us to this point today and how we think a certain scenario had occurred. Volunteers and investigators, including the FBI, scouring the area. Authorities interviewing more than 400 people. There's still a lot of questions of what happened to her. Where is she? Why? Why would you do this to someone that you've been with for so many years? Lindsay, Suzanne's body has never been found. Her sister tells ABC News she's praying for her brother-in-law and forgives him. Barry Morphew is due back in court May 27th. Lindsay. Stephanie, thank you. There's certainly no denying COVID has had such a major impact on all of our lives, but one group is using their sense of community and resilience to support each other like family. During this Asian American and Pacific Islander month, we take a look at the rich history and culture that serves as their foundation to push ahead and the new generation that it's fighting to preserve it. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has this story. Here in the heart of New York City's Chinatown, there are signs that life is slowly getting back to normal. It's a welcome relief for many. The global pandemic wreaked havoc on this close-knit community, both financially and emotionally. Once thriving businesses, now permanently closed. And residents concerned and in some cases fearful for their safety. Asian lives matter! As racist attacks continue to plague the Asian American community here and across the country. Pearl River Mart owner Joanne Kwong rallying to take care of her neighbors, especially the elderly. We've done a couple of different initiatives that we're super proud of. One is called Light Up Chinatown, and we ended up having people adopt a lantern, and you can go visit your lantern in Chinatown. It basically brightens up the street for our elders, you know, walk in the streets at night so that they feel a little bit safer. Established in 1971, Pearl River Mart became the first Chinese department store in the U.S. Today, a new location and a new chapter in a long history. It's about bringing people together, providing a space, mm -hmm. and for 50 years, because uh, this is our 50th anniversary, Pearl River has been that community space for Chinatown and for the Chinatown community. But we feel very proud to be Asian here, and we want to share kind of culture and space with each other, but also with the rest of the city. We were visiting Pearl River Market around 10 years ago, just the double whammy of COVID and with like a lot of what's going on in the city, so thought it would be really good to support it. And here, 200 feet that will take you back in time. Doyer Street, home to Wilson Tang's Nam Wah Tea Parlor, which just last year celebrated their 100 year anniversary. One of the ma major challenges during the pandemic was just keeping our staff safe. We had an um, interesting schedule, like we were open a little later, we'll close a little earlier. The business was concerned, it was, was keeping our guys in a safe place. Wilson is heartened and inspired by his community's actions. I am really proud of um, today's young adults who are mobilizing to help the elderly in need, help sign up for vaccines or to help them with personal safety devices, just advocating for them because we're not here without them. Being in lockdown for the first month, of course, there's a lot of anxiety, people, there's a lot of fear. But I think that's when ideas started bubbling within the community. How are we going to help the businesses that aren't surviving. Like Wilson, Corey Ng, too, was born and raised here, opening up Milk and Cream Cereal Bar four years ago. The shop then partnered with other businesses in the area. When Chinatown really needed the help, when the elderly needed meals, when businesses needed fundraising, everyone came together. It's a lot of little micro organizations 
doing their individual parts with all the same mission. The new generation embodying the same resilience and fortitude exemplified by their ancestors who first came to the U.S. and called these streets home. I would love for my son to take this over. That would be great uh, just to keep the traditions alive. Our thanks to Eva for that. Throughout the pandemic, many of us have learned to adapt, if not outright change, as we've experienced tremendous loss, struggles with money, and reevaluating relationships. Joining us now is Anna Sale, host of New York Public Radio's Death, Sex, and Money, and author of the new book, Let's Talk About Hard Things. Anna, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me. So let's talk about hard things, really delves deep into the complexities and relationships that people have within the subjects of death, sex, money, family, and identity. Why are these specific five subjects so necessary to, to unpack in order to have a better grasp on discussing and navigating difficult conversations? Well, the way I look at it, like these are big topics that all of us run into hard things about. Um, in different ways. And I think even though all of us all alongside each other are struggling with these big things, um, we often don't share. We don't talk about them with our friends or we kind of grasp for words when we're having a hard conversation with our, our partner or spouses. And so I wanted this book to be kind of a guidebook for what, what if you tried to have more kind of descriptive conversations about these hard things, share with each other. So you aren't necessarily trying to fix these hard things, but sharing how you're experiencing them together. And the book, of course, comes as a global community is still suffering from the impacts of COVID-19. How did the pandemic influence or, or change how you communicated and approach these times? Yeah, I mean, one of the arguments of the book is that the way that America has changed in the last, you know, 50 years, decades, is that we used to have more rituals and conventions to sort of stand in for these hard conversations. And that's been a long trend historically in America, how that has changed. And then it was an abrupt acceleration during the pandemic of, you know, even if you felt like you could gather, say, around a death or something and not have to put words to it before the pandemic, all of a sudden, if you lost someone in your life and then you were trying to reach out to someone else who was grieving, you had to figure out how to use words to express care. You couldn't just hug them at the end of a receiving line. And so I wanted to, to have this book be a sort of place where we, to hear a lot of different stories about what people shared. You know, this helped me when I was in deep grief, hearing this kind of thing, like, like I'm so sorry, I miss him too. It's gonna take a long time to feel normal. Instead of something like, um, you know, I, I interviewed somebody who said, you'll find somebody else after she lost her partner when she was pretty young, like to find words that sort of meet people in the hard thing instead of trying to problem solve it or fix it for them. Right. Just kind of meet them where they are. And I think that that's why a lot of people kind of push these conversations off because they're hard, right? So they try and avoid talking about them. And of course, your book is about confronting these hard topics and vulnerability, openness, communication, how that can help unburden the pressures of, of dealing with life experiences all on your own. But you also emphasize knowing the limits that you should have as far as what you share and whom you're sharing with, and sometimes even not saying anything at all. Why is putting boundaries on how you tell your experience equally as important as when you choose to share them? Well, you know, you can sort of feel like, oh, if someone is coming to me, you know, say someone wants to come to you and say, I really want to talk to you about this hard thing, something, conflict that they've been having or something. And you are, you know, on your way to, to trying to pick up your kids from preschool. You know, you, it's not a good time. Like, and you feel, Ugh, I want to honor this person, but also I can't do this right now. I, I want to give you permission to say I want to have this conversation, but I want to have it when I can give you my full attention. Uh, and the other thing is, of course, like when you're dealing with really hard things, I'm, I'm not arguing that you need to talk about it with everyone in your life. You know, there are certain relationships where you might have noticed it's difficult for you to feel heard by someone. Maybe someone is not willing to really listen to what pain something has caused you. So, so it's about finding and being, you know, intentional about, who in your life can really sort of be that person and hear you and you can hear them when they're telling you something hard. 
um, and, and protecting that part of yourself because you are being open about something hard. Um, so I'm not arguing for all of us to go out into the streets and start yelling our private information. More of the argument of the book is that when you are going through a hard thing, when you lean in to trying to talk about it with someone in your life, what that does, it doesn't make the hard thing go away, but it lifts the shame, the heaviness of stigma, the isolation, and it gives you some company uh, while you move through. And lastly, one thing that resonated as well was the, the idea that just because you're having these conversations about the hard things, it doesn't always mean that you're going to find the resolution. Can you explain why letting go and accepting things that cannot be changed is a significant step in the path toward healing? Yeah, I mean, I think of this in two ways. I think a, a successful hard conversation does not need to end in a resolution. Sometimes you have something that you need to say to someone in your life and they're gonna have a really different read and you can end the conversation with, well, now we know we really disagree about this fundamental thing. Um, and secondly, sometimes you can be talking about a hard thing over and over again with someone in your life, trying to resolve some conflict that's naughty and just won't unwind. Sometimes when you have that conversation again and again and it doesn't move and it doesn't sort of shift, that could be telling you, okay, we can stop having this hard conversation. We are not going to come to a resolution, or at least we need a break from doing this with each other. Um, it's also important when you're talking about hard things to know when to stop talking. Well, this was easy. This was uh, not at all a hard conversation, Anna. We, we thank you so much for your insight and for talking with us tonight. Let's Talk About Hard Things is available wherever books are sold. And still to come, the explosion in the Maldives and the former president now in the hospital and our sneak peek at the concert aimed at reuniting the world. Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. 
Welcome back. We're tracking several international headlines at this hour. The investigation now underway after the former president of the Maldives was injured after an explosion as he was about to get into a car. Early reports suggest some type of bomb was put on a motorcycle parked nearby. Several others were injured. Investigators in the tourist hotspot believe the blast was targeted. A gun battle erupted in a favela in Rio, leaving one officer dead and 24 suspected gang members injured. The police raid that led to the shootout began when dozens of heavily armed special forces descended into the neighborhood. They were targeting teenagers allegedly being recruited to traffic guns. But some residents say in the community that the, the police came in waging war and that, quote, children were killed in the process. And the concerns are growing tonight that the COVID cases in Nepal, which borders India, are spiking so fast that the situation there threatens to mimic that of India. Cases are skyrocketing the home of Mount Everest and the nation's leaders are pleading for help. We turn now to Tess Holiday. The model is now revealing her battle with anorexia. With eating disorders on the rise during the pandemic, Arcana Whitworth spoke exclusively to Holiday about her struggle and what she wants others to know. Supermodel Tess Holiday revealing her struggle with anorexia. The mother of two saying she was recently diagnosed by a psychologist, but has ultimately been struggling with disordered eating most of her life. I always thought that I overate. But then people in my life would say, oh yeah, I eat more than Tess. And it was almost like I wore it as a badge of honor. Known for loving and celebrating her curves as a body positive activist, Holiday has been receiving support for her honesty for many, but also being questioned by some online about how she could love her body and also have an eating disorder. I've had a lot of messages from folks that are anorexic that are livid and angry because they feel like I'm lying. I am plus size, but advocating for diversity and larger bodies. And so I think for people hearing me say I'm anorexic was really jarring. Holiday's dietitian Anna Sweeney says, if you think that most eating disorders are visible conditions, you're wrong. Eating disorders don't have to look a certain way. I understand that people look at me and I don't fit what we have seen presented as, you know, the diagnosis for anorexia. But then for me, that tells me that there's a larger problem, which I've been actually saying for years, is that we have a, like, a lack of diversity and representation in the world. Eating disorders are extremely common and may affect nearly one in every 10 people. According to a recent study, about 9% of the U.S. population, almost 29 million people, will have an eating disorder in their lifetime. And the numbers are on the rise during the pandemic. The National Eating Disorders Association reporting a 41% increase in calls to their helplines. Holiday sharing highs and lows, including her divorce, with over 2 million followers on Instagram, hoping to reach others that might be facing a similar battle. You wrote, I'm the result of a culture that celebrates thinness and equates that to worth, but I get to write my own narrative. So tell me, what is that story now? I mean, the sky's the limit. I actually feel like I can take on the things that life is throwing my way, and, and I have been happier in the last six months through my recovery than I've been in my entire life. I feel whole, I feel at peace, I really feel in my power. Our thanks to Kena for bringing us her story. This Saturday, some of the biggest names in Hollywood and music will join forces to shine a light on vaccine equity. It's one of the first major concerts being put together as COVID restrictions start to ease. Our Kaylee Hartung has a preview. It feels really good. It feels really good to be together. I mean, I'm seeing so many familiar faces. I see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's being billed as the concert to reunite the world. Vax Live is bringing together music and Hollywood's biggest stars on one stage to shine a light on the importance of vaccine equity around the globe while reminding us 
what normal feels like. It just feels like we're getting back to the live show. We're getting back to that real life connection and music is bringing people back together. So I'm happy to be part of it. A concert with a cause, raising dollars for doses. International advocacy organization Global Citizen announcing the campaign's already raised more than $50 million. That's more than 10 million shots for the poorest nations. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle lending their star power to chair the event. What we do in this moment will stand in history. And tonight, we stand in solidarity with the millions of families across India who are battling a devastating second wave. The fundraiser was taped before an audience of nearly 30,000 fully vaccinated frontline healthcare and essential workers. We got to sit at home and be worried and scared, and these frontline workers were there the entire time and giving their life for for everyone else. So I couldn't be more excited to celebrate them, but also at the same time, be on a stage, be normal again. This Saturday night, multiple networks will broadcast the show around the world with performances by Jennifer Lopez, Eddie Vedder, Foo Fighters, Jay Balvin, and her. So I'm just honored that these amazing artists have decided to, to lend their incredible support tonight to rally the whole world. This is going to be broadcast to a billion people on the planet. And so we're thrilled that these artists are lending their best support to help make this happen. The Vax Live campaign is also calling on governments to share excess doses with underserved countries and for pharma companies to make vaccines available at not-for-profit prices. What's happening in our country and how many people are getting vaccinated is so great, but we're only as safe as the other countries. I want to do nothing more than to shine the light on why it's important, why people should get it, and why other people who may not, you know, be a part of our country desperately need this as well. The event making history as the first ever large scale concert for a COVID compliant audience and proving we can come back together safely if we support vaccine efforts on a global scale. It's beautiful to see people now, you know, it's been a while. Tonight is such an exciting step in the right direction. I'm at yeah. a concert, live music. I know. In an arena. Yeah. Are you J -Lo. kidding me? It's huge. J -Lo. It feels surreal. It feels like like be born again. No matter where you come from, where you are or where you're based, you should also have access to this vaccine so that we can continue to build a new world and move forward. A rally for the entire world. Our thanks to Kaylee Hartung for that. You can catch Global Citizens Vax Live, the concert to reunite the world this Saturday on ABC News Live at 8 p.m. Eastern. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. Why the fascination?